So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining our uh, event dedicated to uh, crypto assets. Uh, it is a project that uh, IFRAG has initiated a while ago and that gave rise to publication of a uh, discussion paper. So, the objective of the session today um, is, well, first to have a to make a, to have an overview of um, uh, crypto assets market to have a good understanding of what we are talking about. Um, then we will go through um, what guidance currently exists uh, in terms of uh, IFRS. We will look at uh, challenges for preparers and users. And then we will look at what uh, the different options um, we, can, uh, we can think of in terms of uh, um, uh, standard setting. Um, we have, um, uh, obviously, it is a webinar uh, which has raised a lot of interest because we had uh, about 300 um, registrants. Uh, that session will be recorded, so for those who um, cannot attend or cannot attend uh, the full session, you can uh, always listen at the end of uh, that, uh, that webinar. Um, so there will be uh, two parts in that presentation. Uh, one will be a presentation of um, uh, development and outlook for uh, crypto markets. Um, along with a presentation made by EFRAG on its um, on its project, as well as a presentation made by made by the ISB, and then we will have a uh, panel session uh, to discuss about um, the accounting challenges and and the way forward. Uh, during the the session, you can ask questions, um, and we will make sure that we can uh, answer your question throughout the, the presentation. Uh, there will also be polling questions, uh, so um, that would be good if you can um, respond to those questions and, and you will have a look at what uh, responses from the participants would be. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome um, our panelists. Uh, I will start with um, Renata Skoda. Uh, Renata is a a uh, member of the board of Global Digital Assets and Cryptocurrencies Association. And she is also a CFO and COO at uh, Blue Fire Capital. Uh, Maria Hervé T. Legara. Um, Maria is a member of EFRAG Financial Instruments Working Group and also a director of accounting and credential policies at BBVA, um, so banking industry. Um, also, Denis Julens. Um, Denis is a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam and a member of the TEG at EFRAG. And Flora Kemp, who is a partner with PwC. Um, from EFRAG, uh, we have Chiara Del Prete. Uh, Chiara is the, the chairwoman of uh, the TEG. Um, Vincent Papa, uh, who is the Associate Director at EFRAG, as well as Isabel Batista, uh, Senior Technical Manager. Vincent and Isabel have been uh, driving that, uh, that project on, on crypto assets. And uh, Boris McKenzie um, as an ISB board member. Um, myself, Olivier Scherrer, I am um, uh, a partner with PwC and are here in my capacity as a, a member of the board of, of EFRAG. So um, with that said, I hand it over to Kira um, to introduce our, our session. Kira. Thanks a lot, Olivier. A good afternoon to all of you. It is so good to see such a big number of registrants for this event. I'm pleased to introduce today uh, this event that has been organized by EFRAG in the context and approaching the end of this uh, outreach and consultation process on the proactive research discussion paper accounting for crypto assets and liabilities, which EFRAG issued back in July 2020. 
As you may know, EFRAG undertakes proactive research activities with the aim of influencing the development of global financial reporting standards and provide thought leadership in developing the principles and practices, among other aims. So the topics of crypto assets was selected following a public consultation, and we are pleased to see that since the research started in 2018, a lot is happening on the market. And we are confident that our contribution with this research and this discussion paper will offer an educational basis for those that are interested in understanding the accounting challenges and will also offer a good starting point for the ISB soon in a possible project on this topic. After one year of consultation period, consultation period that has been kept so long open in order to provide the opportunity to constituents to contribute despite the pandemic and many other compelling consultations. It's now the timing for our feedback statement and uh, the timing of this feedback statement on these consultations will seem, seem to be ideal to offer to the ISB even more material to consider in case they decide to select the project for a future uh, project on the agenda. The IFRS Interpretation Committee issued an agenda decision on holding of cryptocurrencies, and they concluded that when they are not held in an ordinary course of the business, a company applies IAS 38 intangible assets. However, crypto assets are not really intangible assets, and IAS 38 doesn't seem to offer an ideal solution because cryptocurrencies and crypto assets in general have more similarities with cash or financial instruments than with intangibles. Some also consider that due to their intrinsic characteristics, they should be measured at fair value. However, how could we define an active market in this case? We are not facing a regulated market, or I should say not yet. Volumes are relati were relatively low when we started the research, but since then we have seen increasing focus from the regulators as also, and also increasing volumes. Central banks around the world are now investigating central bank digital currencies as a response to the emergence of private stablecoin projects and to meet the needs of an increasingly digitalized economy. In Europe, the ECB may soon announce the continuation of its investigation into a digital euro following a public consultation phase. So you see how important developments are occurring around us on this topic. So it appears now essential to clarify the accounting treatment to be applied. So to promote transparency for a class of transactions with such a potential for market innovation, and to be ready for a possible acceleration of mainstream investments. As you see in the questions we raise in the discussion paper, there are still important open questions. Are crypto assets a separate asset class that deserves a specific standard, or we are simply facing a technological innovation and uh, the services and transactions are already known, and so they are performed with other means and existing standards should be able to provide the right answer. So questions, these are questions that also today are relevant for this event. I leave you now the floor to Olivier and his excellent panel of experts uh, for what I anticipate will be an engaging debate. But let me express to Olivier and all the other panelists my gratitude on behalf of EFRAG for having accepted to be with us today. And a final remark, EFRAG consultation on this discussion paper ends at the end of this month. So you still have time to contribute and thanks a lot in advance for your comment and contribution. Olivier, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Chiara, for setting the scene. Um, you can see on your screen, uh, for those who have responded, um, the split of uh, your background. So we have mainly uh, about a third of auditors, uh, then preparers, about uh, 20%. Uh, we have regulators, 17%. Um, so uh, there is quite a, a large diversity of uh, stakeholders. Um, so, um, Chiara, you, you mentioned the, the, the growing interest in crypto assets, and uh, this is something that Flora Camp will uh, demonstrate and in going into a bit deeper in, into uh, how the, the crypto assets market has developed over the past years. Flora. 
Thank you, Olivier and Chiara. So I'm going now to present the key trends and challenges that the crypto assets market is currently facing. So let's start with key breakthrough we observed for the last 12 months. So we have identified six main trends. The first trend is crypto assets are here. Say crypto assets are here could sound as a commonplace or even a banality today, but let's remember that three to four years ago, crypto assets were a niche market for early adopters only. And those early adopters were mainly geeks, if I can say that, and pure players. 2020 was a key year, a pivotal year, as crypto assets adoption is massively increased since the last 12 months. And there was clearly a takeoff in 2020 for the crypto assets market. And we anticipate a trend that they will become mainstream in the coming years, as Kara just told us. We see as well that the crypto assets market is becoming more and more diverse and more and more structured with different products payment tokens, utility tokens, security tokens, stable coins crypto assets, derivatives, NFTs, smart contracts, and so on, with different services like staking, lending, borrowing, insuring through decentralized finance, crypto loyalty programs as well, and with different issuers and investors, not only pure players, but now big companies coming from other industries are entering in the crypto market. And I'm, I'm thinking about retail and consumer firms, also big tech firms, big payment firms, hedge funds or investment banks. We see as well more and more m and transactions and also in general media, not only crypto media, we can see that they are talking every day about crypto assets. So in 2020, I think we can acknowledge that crypto assets are really here and that there is a market. This market is more and more active. The offer and the demand are becoming quantitatively and qualitatively bigger and bigger. Second trend, it's a question. Are they coming a respectable class of assets? So it is true that today, large and listed entities like IFRS companies have for the moment limited exposure to crypto asset holdings. But, but what is new in the last 12 months is that those large and listed entities and among them IFRS companies, when we ask them, do you plan to issue or hold crypto assets? Now, the response that our big clients at PwC give to this question is maybe, Maybe yes, or even, of course, we don't have the choice, we have to go there. Whereas the response was clearly no, or even no way from three to four years ago. So there is clearly a change of mindset and sometimes a change of strategy from large entities and especially B2C companies that are becoming aware that their clients, their customers are ready to pay with cryptocurrencies or to benefit from loyalty programs for utility tokens, for instance. And consequently, this type of companies, they want to prepare and be ready for the adoption of crypto assets. So to put it in a shell, I think that the image and the reputation of crypto assets has been changing for the last 12 months. And clearly, traditional companies and institutions such as central banks, regulators, accounting standards setters, academics, as well as auditors, are taking the subject very, very seriously. And in that sense, it seems that the crypto assets are now becoming a respectable class of assets. Trend number three is the growth of stable coins. So a stable coin is a digital asset that is linked to an underlying more stable asset, such a national currency like USD or Euro, or a commodity such as gold. And the objective of a stable coin is to protect investors from crypto market volatility. The US dollar pegged stable coins such as Tether or USDC are the market leaders. And here too, we see the same trend. 2020 is a year of takeoff 
for stable coins. Trend number four, it's CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. So whereas stable coins are private coins, central banks are also part of the game with the introduction of CBDC. A CBDC is a country's official currency in digital form. And we can see now that we have more than 60 central banks have been exploring CBDC since 2014. And some CBDC projects are now entering into implementation phases. The most well-known one is in China, with the pilot phase of the digital yuan in several big Chinese cities in 2020. Trend number five is DeFi, decentralized finance. So what is DeFi? DeFi is the delivery of financial services, such as lending, borrowing, insuring without any centralized intermediaries using features of blockchain technology. And decentralized finance has experienced increasing growth since mid-2020. And it's true that it is still in its early days, but clearly DeFi has shown us that offering decentralized financial services at scale seems possible now. Then the last trend is NFTs, so non-fungible tokens. There are digital assets representing products in the real life as well as the digital world. These assets are unique and collectible tokens, and they are being used mainly in the art, sport, or gaming industries. Here too, we see the same trend, 2020 is a year of takeoff for NFTs. So, just after these slides, we have three slides that you, get, you can see the same curve, and this is a takeoff in 2020. So we can go quickly through them, but I think that the main message here is that it's always, always the same trend, the takeoff in 2020. Let's talk now about the key challenges for scalability in 2021. So even if there is more and more crypto adoption, crypto assets are currently insignificant in scale if we compare to mainstream currencies and asset classes like equities, bonds, and commodities. But there are some factors that could potentially contribute to greater institutionalization of crypto assets. And I'm going to present five of them quickly but they are very well described in more details in the IFRAC discussion paper. So first, let's take an example that we all know that today, if you want to pay a coffee in Bitcoin, it will take you several minutes to pay, and the price of the coffee could be significantly very different from the moment you arrive in the restaurant to the moment you leave the restaurant. And clearly, this is one of the challenges uh, for, for crypto assets. So the first one is the speed to process crypto assets transactions and the number of transactions you can process on the blockchain by second, as well as the cross-chain interoperability is the key technical, technical challenge for increasing scalability of crypto assets. The second big challenge is price volatility. And it's true that the volatility of the prices of crypto assets currently limits their capacity to serve as a medium of payment or store of value. And stable coins or CBDCs can be a response to address the price volatility. The first challenge is the potential perceived conflict between sustainability goals and crypto asset market developments. So studies are quite limited in this area, but they are more and more uh, numerous, and mainly they are focused on the Bitcoin blockchain and the mining process. But I think it's, it is important to know that there are some blockchains that are clearly more eco-friendly than others, and notably depending on the way they have been designed new generation of blockchain using the proof of stake technology, such as Tezos, for instance, seems to be much more eco-friendly, greener than the first generation of blockchain using the proof of work technology, such as Bitcoin. 
So I know that more research results on blockchain sustainability will be released in the following month, and it will be very interesting to see which blockchains are the most sustainable. Challenge number four is trust. And the feedback we have from our clients at PwC is that because blockchain is decentralized, they need more trust, more confidence, and more assurance from independent third parties on their own crypto activities and more generally on what is going on on the crypto asset market. So truly, they're, clearly, their audit firms have a role to play to bring more trust on the crypto assets market as well as all independent institutions. And last challenge is the regulation. To start to invest or to invest more in crypto assets, a lot of companies, especially traditional companies, which are not pure players in crypto assets, they want to do it, but they want to do it properly with regulated platform, regulated partners. They don't want to have any bad surprise. And they need some clarity and visibility regarding accounting, legal, and tax incidences if they hold crypto assets or if they issue crypto assets. So clearly, to have a clear accounting, legal, and tax framework will support definitely the scalability of the crypto market. So to conclude, I think we can say that 2020 was a remarkable year for crypto assets market with major breakthroughs and achievements that I can summarize in a few words, takeoff and acceleration of crypto adoption. Many thanks, Flora. Uh, that was uh, very interesting to, to understand how uh, well, crypto assets market is, is evolving, developing, and as you said, uh, uh, is taking off. Um, we understand that there are many operational challenges that are uh, associated with that, but uh, we are not addressed uh, all of them. Uh, and we are more going to focus now on um, accounting uh, challenges. Um, and on that, um, I will hand it over to Vincent and uh, Isabel to lead us through um, uh, the thinking that has been developed by EFRAG on how to respond to uh, reporting challenges that we have with respect to all those new uh, instruments. Uh, Vincent, Isabella. Thanks, uh, Olivier. So Isabel and I will present the headline findings of the EFRAG discussion paper, which Kiara referenced uh, when she was setting the scene. If you could move to the next slide, please. Next slide. So I'll just make a few comments about the discussion paper itself. So it consists of both a problem definition as well as an outline of the way forward for addressing IFRS-related requirements. Now, IFRA's research was actually informed by an extensive review of both academic and practice-oriented literature. We also had a phase where we undertook extensive outreach to experts uh, within the crypto assets market. And we reached out to experts of varied functional profiles, so auditors, regulators, crypto research firms, as well as national standard setters. In our discussion paper, we review in detail the accounting challenges for holders and issuers, as well as the valuation considerations. And thereafter, we do propose a series of options that could be considered as a way forward. As Flora did mention, we do have a chapter on potential market developments and we do recognize that we are dealing with a rapidly evolving ecosystem, I think, as was highlighted by both Flora and Chiara. That being said, a central principle that we put forward in the discussion paper is that there's need to actually focus on the economic substance and the individual characteristics when developing both regulatory and accounting requirements. In effect, there needs to be a technology neutral approach. Uh, it's really essential when you're thinking about the accounting requirements. So in this slide, we just show the outline of the discussion paper and the various themes that were covered. If you could move to the next slide, please. So in the next slide, we turn to the holder accounting. And here, I will share some of the headline findings. Uh, first, I'll note that I think as Kiara did mention, the 2019 agenda decision 
by the IFRS Interpretation Committee uh, came to the conclusion that cryptocurrencies, whereby there's no claim on the issuer, those ought to be classified as either intangibles or inventory, depending on the business purpose. That being said, the scope of our discussion paper was broader than cryptocurrencies. So we looked at the whole range of the whole ambit of private tokens, as well as actually CBDCs to, to a limited extent. So the scope was broader than the agenda decision. Comments have also been made around IS-38 and its fitness for purpose. Here, I would note that IS-38 was issued in 1998. And I think as Kiara pointed out, there are challenges as far as applying IS-38 for, for crypto assets. That being said, I guess there are cases where it would be suitable to apply IS-38, but there's a question as to whether in all instances, is it the most appropriate uh, uh, accounting approach? And could there be uh, improvements or enhancement made to IS-38 such that it can be fit for purpose? Uh, in the context of the broad range of crypto assets that are in place. Just making some comments on uh, the challenges that we found in relation to both IS-38 and IS-2. Um, as noted, they do not always lead to relevant accounting for crypto assets. Specifically, there's a problem when entities can recognize price declines of highly volatile assets, but when they do face limitations towards recognizing uh, the price appreciation. There's also concern with the IS-38 revaluation approach, which imposes restrictions towards the application of fair value measurement in the absence of active markets. Questions could also arise around the appropriate impairment approach when entities have to apply the cost measurement basis. In addition, particularly for users of financial statements, uh, there could be the challenge of comparing the impairments uh, that are reported across various entities. So there's a comparability question uh, that would be at play. Overall, I would say that the overarching challenge really is around the measurement. And uh, I think what stakeholders have indicated is that bearing in mind the financial instrument-like characteristics of crypto assets, um, it actually would be appropriate to consider a fair value through P&L approach in their measurement. In that regard, there have been suggestions that crypto assets should be scoped out of IS-38 and possibly to allow preparers an accounting policy choice, that is to apply the IS-8 um, standard in effect. Alternatively, some stakeholders have also suggested that crypto assets could be scoped into IFRS 9, whereby the uh, SPPI or the solely payments of principal and interest test uh, can be applied to determine whether to apply either the cost or fair value measurement uh, for respective uh, crypto assets. But looking beyond crypto assets themselves, I would note that uh, our research actually points to a broader challenge. Uh, these findings that we are hi highlighting point to a broader challenge, uh, and it notes that there's need for guidance which looks at non-financial assets in a broader sense particularly when these are held as investments. And in our outreach on the discussion paper, some stakeholders have actually proposed the idea of a standard for all non-financial assets that are held as investments. So go beyond just looking at the crypto assets problem, but look at a broader range of assets and develop a standard. Because one argument that's sometimes put forward is that at this point in time, crypto assets are not pervasive. But when you have a a breadth, or at least you look at a broader range of assets, then there may be more case for change as far as thinking of an, as of an asset standard that is appropriate. But going beyond IS-38 and IS-2, there are other holder-related challenges which we highlight in the discussion paper. And this relates to, first, the financial asset classification. So we do note that security tokens may not qualify as financial assets uh, based on their IS-32 definitions, even when these actually do have features that are similar to traditional equity and debt securities. I, I guess there's a challenge when you think about the smart contract features. This is the question of legal enforceability. And this can be in question, especially if no party or counterparty can be compelled to perform by a court. A second point, uh, I think, which Kiara also did allude to, is around the cash and cash equivalent classification. Here, I would note that the 2019 agenda decision 
noted the inappropriateness of cash definitions uh, for cryptocurrencies as they are not legal tender and cannot be used as a unit of account. Nonetheless, as I think was pointed out by uh, Flora, there's been the emergence of fiat currency backed stable coins as, as well as the central bank digital currencies. And this has raised questions on whether the definition of cash equivalent and IFRS requirements needs to be updated. I would note that the IS-7 definition of cash equivalence includes the notions of being readily convertible to cash, as well as being subject to a significant risk of changes in value. I would also like just to refer to a recent published study in the Australian Accounting Review, which assessed 11 of the more well-known stable coins, that's the fiat currency backed stable coins. So they looked at the universe and the number they were looking at were 46 stable coins and 19 of those are fiat currency backed. And from those, they selected 11. And when they actually assessed the characteristics, specifically the convertibility to cash, as well as the price volatility patterns, they found that they are no different from fiat currency pairs and money market indexes. And this may raise the question as to whether there could be an extension of the IS-7 definition to encompass uh, this type of stable coins. The final point I will touch on is that the discussion paper also points to the need to clarify the accounting by custodial services and other intermediary holders, specifically on the question of who has economic control and thereby needs to recognize the holdings of the balance sheet. In our discussion paper, we note that there's no explicit IFRS guidance uh, for those who hold on behalf of others. And we highlight indicators of control that could be considered, or at least uh, taken into account when thinking of the appropriate classification. And these indicators have been drawn from the accounting firms' publications, as well as other literature uh, from, I would say, for example, the professional bodies. That being said, there remains an overarching need to clarify IFRS guidance related to those who hold cryptos or crypto assets on behalf of others. That would conclude my summary of the crypto asset holder recognition and measurement requirements, where there's need for further consideration from the ISB standpoint. And here I'll hand over to Isabel, who will talk you through the rest of the headline findings in the IFRA discussion paper. Thank, thank you, Vincent, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, issuer accounting first. Uh, so that's a chap one of the chapters in um, the IFRA discussion paper. So, of course, to be a holder, um, the coin or the token needs to be issued. And uh, when one thinks about uh, issuer accounting, I think what comes to mind is uh, an ICO. So uh, I guess we're all very familiar with an IPO, uh, so an initial public offering. Uh, so when you issue shares for the first time onto the market. And a very similar thing happens with, uh, with cryptos. Um, so they've all started with, um, with ICOs, initial coin offerings. And since, um, since the crypto, crypto start, um, there are other ways to also issue tokens. And I'm thinking of sort of the, the also a recent trend in that the exchanges also issue tokens, and they are referred to as initial exchange offerings. So um, I think as Flora mentioned, um, I think one of the important things when you think about ICOs or similar offerings is, is this really relevant? So, so why do we want to worry about accounting? Is this a prevalent thing? And I want to mention, um, just adding to what Flora said, that since our discussion paper was published, um, the data referred to 2019, December, and it says that there were approximately 5,000 tokens at the time, according to the information on coin market cap, um, of a value of approximately $192 million billion. Today, I checked coin market cap statistics, and we've got almost 11,000 tokens with a market cap of 1.44 trillion US dollars. So in less than, um, well, more or less one and a half years, this is what has happened in the ICO market. So it has been a significant evolution, I would say, in the ICO market or, or, the, or another type of uh, exchange market in terms of issuance. 
So we think, okay, which standards do we do we want to apply? Uh, which standards we, could we apply? I think, as already mentioned by Vincent, um, IFRS 9 comes to mind. Um, there are many tokens, as you probably know, that have characteristics um, of equity instruments. So we think, well, financial liability under IFRS 9, um, also classification and presentation under IS32. So for those, I think, you know, IFRS 9 could probably cater for um, security tokens. There might be a little bit of tweaking needed in IFRS 9 in order to meet the definition of a financial instrument. But tokens that are not um, uh, security tokens, that are not uh, similar to financial instruments, what to do with those? Um, as you probably know, many tokens actually have a utility. So um, other than the, the Bitcoin, um, as mentioned by Flora, uh, the market in DeFi and, and NFTs has increased a lot since last year. Um, these tokens offer more than a payment service. They have a utility. They offer you a network, a blockchain platform where many things can be done. So essentially, as an issuer, they provide a service to the, to the holder. And so the, the question is, would, um, would IFRS 15 apply? Um, so revenue from customers, from contracts with customers. Um, if it did apply, there is a very key question um, as to whether you do have an enforceable contract with a customer. Again, as mentioned earlier on by, by Flora, regulation is coming up, but it's not kind of there yet, at least not in all jurisdictions. So without regulation, one might question, do I have an enforceable contract with a customer? That's probably beyond IFRS, but in the, with taking the view that regulation does come up and um, there could be an enforceability um, sort of requirement, then perhaps IFRS 15 could apply. And if you don't meet any of the above, well, is there a provision under our old standard IS 37, which is the standard on provisions? Uh, do we have a some sort of an obligation, perhaps a constructive obligation, um, that we would account for uh, using IS 37? Now, if you don't have an obligation as an issuer, a um, little typo um, sort of now been fixed. So if no obligation exists, then I guess the obvious question, the obvious answer is going to be P&L. So you're going to recognize um, the, um, the the revenue you receive as a profit in your P&L. Um, now these are sort of the sort of the top sort of key items one would think about in terms of accounting, but. There are other areas that uh, also need some clarification. Um, with with um, the issuance market and the growing market in uh, sort of ICOs, um, there's also things like some employees, and I'm thinking typically of startup companies, which of course could be acquired by IFRS listed companies as the market evolves. It's my opinion likely to happen. Payment could be made to the employees in token. So how to account for that under IFRS? Do we have um, some guidance in IFRS 2, which deals with um, share-based payments? Do we have guidance under IS 19, that's the more general standard under IFRS for employee benefits? Um, also, um, what about ICO issue costs? Now, we're all very familiar, um, if we are accountants, with how to deal with um, equity costs if you issue um, a stock. Um, you have typically the issuance cost. We know how to account for that under IS32. But what to do if there's an ICO? Can we analogize to IS32 for this cost of issuing um, the tokens? There are a lot of other sort of sort of buzzwords like airdrops. Um, airdrops typically are uh, free tokens. They are kind of freebies. Um, they are used for um, for various reasons, but typically they are a marketing tool, whereas uh, the more you buy, you can get some free ones. It's very, very much used in the IC ICO market, um, especially the very, very new tokens, um, where the more you keep, the more you get. If you sell, the less you get, so you kind of pay a penalty or you receive a, um, a benefit for keeping them. So there are these sort of free tokens, how to account for those. So uh, those are kind of the main areas I wanted to, to talk about um, in the issuer accounting section. And I'm going to move next um, to valuation. So valuation. I think this is probably one of the most challenging um, sort of areas um, uh, around crypto assets. And I think also 
um, Flora touched upon just now um, in her presentation, you know, the, the, the various key, key characteristics of cryptos like volatility create a lot of challenges. So as we know, um, it's a new market. I mean, cryptos essentially started in 2009 when Bitcoin was launched. And uh, in the last um, 11 years, uh, it has uh, been growing. However, um, although some some coins um, like Bitcoin and Ethereum have, in a way, stabilized in some way, there are many, many others that um, have not really stabilized and are subject to very high volatility. Um, also, what are the characteristics of a crypto? What do actually cryptos do? I mean, I, I guess in order to find a methodology for valuation, you've got to understand the fundamental features of the crypto. Um, so the fact that it's um, in the early stage, the fact that there's volatility, and the fact that we need to better understand the features, what a crypto does, are all the questions that are fundamental to valuation. Um, if we think uh, during our outreach, we have heard that IFRS 13 is a good starting point. And it probably is because we always we think, well, fair value would probably be the best way to value cryptos, at least some of the cryptos. So is IFRS 13 the right standard? Um, but challenges can exist. I mean, I'm just going to think about what is an active market for the crypto market. Um, there are many exchanges. Um, many of them are not regulated. Um, as many of you probably know, the price variation on exchanges can be very significant. Um, on one market, you might have a crypto at one euro, and in another exchange, it could actually be two euros. It does happen. So how do you basket the exchanges in order to arrive at sort of the market you're going to be looking at? So very, very important. Um, also, IFRS 13 is kind of written with cash in mind. So it has to be an exchange for cash. And this is not always the feature of cryptos. Cryptos work um, both um, with an exchange crypto to fiat, i.e. crypto to euro, crypto to dollar, or another currency, or it also works uh, crypto to crypto. So there's kind of this intermediary. If you are on an exchange, you're going to have a crypto to crypto, and then you're going to exchange that to fiat. So there's kind of an intermediate um, process going through, which doesn't exactly fit into the definition um, of fair value of active market under IFRS 13. Um, in the FREC discussion paper, we looked at uh, what are the valuation methodologies out there right now. Um, there is some research, not a lot, but the some research we did find, uh, one of the interesting papers that we found back then was a paper issued by the Chartered Business Valuations um, uh, Association in Canada, uh, the CBV, and they had a research paper that they published in 2019 that examined three valuation methodologies. And um, the first one, um, cost of production. Now, cost of production, one can um, see a parallel to what we know as cost under IFRS. And perhaps for some cryptos, um, let's think Bitcoin. Bitcoin is mined, and um, you can estimate the mining costs, how much it has cost you uh, to mine a Bitcoin. And I think as Flora mentioned earlier on, I mean, the sort of mining process can be extremely expensive in countries where electricity is very expensive. Um, but it is a number you can determine based on um, your costs. Uh, the second um, methodology discussed um, in this paper and in many other papers, um, um, is the equation of exchange. And the equation of exchange can be analogized um, to what we know in IFRS as a cash, as a sort of a, a, a cash flow technique. So estimating what cash flows um, this particular crypto asset um, can produce. Um, and there are various mechanisms um, in order to, uh, to determine this. Um, however, again, how do we determine a, a cash flow of something that's not yet being used? I mean, even for the tokens that have utility, so typically in the DeFi world, um, they have a lending or um, sort of a lending utility. How do we estimate uh, the cash flows? Um, 
one of probably uh, some of the easy ones could be uh, with a, a coin of an exchange. It's take Binance coin. You can probably estimate the cash flows because you have volume and you know how much the coin is. So you have the transaction fees. So you could probably estimate it based on that. Um, and finally, uh, what is referred to as the network value to transaction ratio, um, yes, it's maybe a, a different term, but it's equivalent to what we know in IFRS as the market price. So with cryptos, um, you have a network, and so you can actually uh, come up with a market value by actually knowing the value of the network and knowing the volume on the network. And this information is publicly available. Um, I mean, for example, CoinMarketCap gives you this information for all the tokens that are reported on its uh, data platform. Whether that information is correct, I can't say. But it is available and it can be used as a mechanism to calculate a market value. Now, whether that market value meets the definition under IFRS 13 is another question. Um, and um, I think that's really what I want to say with the, with the valuation um, sort of chapter, which is chapter five of our, of our discussion paper. And I'll move on then to the next slide, please. So finally, um, the discussion paper talks about three options that um, could be used as a go-forward mechanism for the ISB to consider. Um, there could be other options, of course, but the three ones we talk about was first is do nothing, so just leave it as it is and see how the market evolves. But as we are hearing, the market has been evolving um, quite fast. And as Laura said earlier on, financial institutions are starting to get very interested um, um, in cryptos, and we know quite a number of financial institutions are already quite involved in crypto. So perhaps that's not the right option. I don't know. Option two um, is um, enhance the explicit requirements we already have under IFRS. So let's just look at the various standards that I talked about earlier on and which Vincent talked about earlier on. So look at IS38, look at IS2, um, IS7, IS32. IFRS 13, IS, IS 37, etc. Can those standards be amended in order to fit in um, crypto accounting for holders, crypto accounting for issuers, and for valuation? Um, and finally, the third option is, you know, start with a clean sheet of paper. And let's issue a, an IFRS standard for crypto assets and crypto liabilities. Um, sort of a, 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 a second tier to the third option, and I think Vincent mentioned it earlier on, is this is go broader. Let us capture um, all types of digital assets and digital liabilities within this new standard, which could also encapsulate sort of investments that are not caught under um, current IFRS. And we're thinking, for example, like sort of works of art and gold and other things that maybe we don't know how to account for very clearly when we think about accounting under IFRS. So essentially, those are the three options that the um, FREG discussion paper talks about. And I think that's my final slide. Is that correct? Yes. So thank you very much. And uh, I now pass the floor um, back to Olivia, right? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. So uh, that was, an, and Vincent, uh, for that presentation of uh, FRAG's um, uh, thinking of um, well, the, the various options, but also the, the, the challenges and, and the landscape around um, accounting. Before we move on, uh, we can have a look at uh, your responses to question two. Um, and you are about uh, nearly 80% to think that um, there will be either a significant or moderate um, increase in the level of exposure to current generation of crypto assets by large institutions within the next three to five years. So uh, I think it's a uh, uh, good, um, good summary of, of the reason why, or good demonstration of the reason why there is uh, the need to give uh, some further thoughts to uh, the, the accounting issues that we are um, uh, preparers and users are facing on, on in that respect. Um, we are going to um, going now to hand it over to both uh, Mackenzie, um, uh, ISB board member, to lead us through uh, well first. Um, 
what have been the ISB's thinking on uh, the accounting based on uh, the existing guidance and what potential options can be uh, for, for the future, both. Thank you very much, uh, Levia, and uh, thanks to the uh, FREC team for the opportunity to be part of the uh, presentation today. Uh, before we start, just a reminder that the views I do express in the presentation are mine and not necessarily those of the, the board or the foundation. Um, I do find it interesting listening to the findings that, uh, that Vincent and Isabel took us through. Um, I think this area definitely highlights that this is an area that raises more questions uh, than there are answers at the moment. Now, this is a developing area, and I'm hoping just to give you an outline of what the ISP has done in, in this area and what you could potentially do in the future. Uh, to start, I'm a great believer in the future of the crypto industry. Um, I believe it has the potential to be the next evolution in global commerce, uh, but we do need the speculative hype to end, and, and I personally believe some degree of regulation for it to really enter the mainstream. Now, from an accounting point of view, there's been very little in the way of guidance issued or time spent addressing this issue. However, as we've seen over the past uh, number of years, this is definitely a growing interest in the area of cryptos, and this may be an emerging issue that the ISP can no longer ignore. Now, whether we address this and to what extent is up to our stakeholders, and, and I'll discuss this a little bit later in our presentation. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, uh, we're just going to take a brief look at the history of the board's discussions on holding of crypto assets. Now, the topic first came to the ISP's attention back in 2016, when the Australian Accounting Standards Board brought a paper to the ASAF uh, on the holding of cryptocurrencies. Now, at that meeting, the board's chair agreed to ask staff to monitor developments in this area. Now, the scope of this monitoring exercise expanded in 2017 and again in 2018 to include crypto assets more widely, and also how entities account for crypto assets that they've issued. In November 2018 and again then in 2019, the board did discuss developments in this area and at that stage decided not to undertake standard setting to change any IFRS standards to address uh, accounting for crypto assets, nor to issue any new standards in this area. Uh, there was, however, an agenda decision that uh, Kiara mentioned earlier, and I'll talk a little bit about this later. If we move on to the next slide, so how should we uh, treat crypto assets under IFRS? Well, I think the main issue is that these type of assets were not specifically scoped directly into any of the IFRS standards, as most of these standards were issued before cryptos became prevalent. Now, some argued that these were inventory, some argued these were assets, and others said that these were potentially financial instruments. Uh, there are also those that argued that this fell completely outside the scope of all standards, and that then what companies should do is develop their own accounting policies using the guidance in IS-8 on accounting policies. Now, moving on to the next slide, uh, the first time this was properly addressed was when the IFRS Interpretations Committee received a submission on this in 2019 in respect of how to account for cryptocurrencies. Now, the committee in its agenda decision confirmed that cryptocurrencies meet the definition of an intangible asset under IS-38. However, the problem there is that IS-38 is a residual standard, and therefore an entity has to consider whether intangible assets are within the scope of other standards before concluding that they fall into IS-38. Now, the committee looked at a number of things. Firstly, they looked at whether cryptocurrencies might be cash. Now, IS-32 on presentation of financial instruments contains a description of why cash is a financial asset and noting that cash represents a medium of exchange and is therefore the basis on which all transactions are measured and recognized in the financial statements. The committee noted, at least in June 2019, there was not a way of any cryptocurrencies that would be accounted for as cash. Now, from my understanding, I don't believe there's any evidence that this situation has changed much since those discussions. Now, many stakeholders would have preferred for these to be accounted for as financial instruments, as they believe these instruments were effectively similar to some equity investments or derivative instruments, and that fair value through profit and loss would have been the best accounting. Now, the committee considered whether cryptocurrencies might be another type of financial instrument, but conclude that they're not, because cryptocurrencies provide no contractual right to cash. So IFRS non-accounting effectively was not an option. Uh, the committee did also look at IS-2 on inventories and see whether that applied. Uh, the agenda decision did conclude that an entity might apply IS-2 to account for its holding of crypto assets if the holding of the crypto assets was for sale in the ordinary course of business. Now, this would typically have resulted in an entity measuring crypto assets at the low of cost or net realizable value. However, of course, there are the broker trader accounting, and under that cryptocurrency would have been measured at fair value. So basically, as an entity concludes that there's no other accounting stance that could have applied to its cryptocurrency 
other than potentially ICE2, then it would apply ICE38 and account to these as intangible assets. Now, what does that mean? So what would the accounting look like under ICE38? Well, remember, ICE38 requires an entity to firstly determine whether an intangible asset is a finite or an indefinite life. Now, in practice, most entities will conclude that cryptocurrencies clearly have an indefinite life, in which case the entity would measure its holding of cryptocurrencies at cost less impairment. Now, IS38 does give the option to revalue intangible assets where there's an active market, but remember that this would be through other comprehensive income, and you would not be recycling those gains on sale. Now, clearly, I don't believe, and I'm sure many people don't, that this really portrays the true nature of the assets. So moving on, where to from here? If we just move on to the next slide, uh, there are many issues that arise from the accounting for cryptos. Uh, these would impact by numerous accounting standards, from revenue to provisions. Now, when an entity has to determine how to account for crypto assets uh, that have been issued, the key question needs to consider is whether the obligations, it, it, well, what obligations arise as a result of that. This question comes before the accounting. I mean, think about it. In essence, it's a legal or regulatory question. The IFRS standards are principle-based, and these set out how to account for the rights and obligations rather than how to account for the form of the contract. Now, once a company has worked out what obligations are, then it considers whether the obligations it's got are within the scope of any specific IFRS standard. Now, on the slide you've got here, you can see four standards that might apply to an obligation arising from crypto assets. Firstly, IFRS 9 could apply if the entity concludes its obligations fit into the definition of a financial liability. IFRS 15 on revenue would apply if the entity has obligations arising from a contract with a customer. IS32 could apply where the obligations meet the definition of equity. And then there's IS37 that is requirements for non-financial liabilities. Now, I want to emphasize that if the entity concludes it's within the scope of any of these standards, it's not using IS8 is it's directly applying the requirements in those standards to apply to, that apply to that transaction. Now, of course, there may be situations when obligation does fall uh, outside the scope of a specific standard. In that case, an entity would potentially use ISA to determine its accounting policy. Remember that ISA is not a free-for-all. ISA requires an entity to develop an accounting policy considering the requirements in any existing IFRS standards dealing with similar or related issues, if none of those apply, then it considers the definitions, recognition criteria, and other concepts in the conceptual framework. From a disclosure point of view, remember that if the obligations you've got fall into standards like IFRS 15 or IS 37, these standards have specific disclosure requirements would apply. There are also additional disclosure requirements in IS 1, a presentation of financial statements, that may be relevant in the issuing or holding of crypto assets. Also remember that if you do determine that these fall into financial instruments, then of course there are IFRS 7 uh, disclosures that will come into play. Uh, moving on to the next slide. I think it's key to point out though that this could change. Now how could it change? Many of you will be aware that the board has recently published a request for information in, relate, in relation to the third agenda consultation. Now this agenda consultation is a process that happens every five years and involves the board asking the stakeholders what topics we should prioritize working on. Now for this agenda consultation, the board has summarized a list of potential projects we could be working on, and this includes possible project on crypto assets. Remember that the agenda consultation is a key step in setting the board's agenda for the next few years. Now it's not to say that if a topic is not added to the agenda as a result of this RFI that we would never address it. The agenda consultation helps us in setting our work agenda, but this can always be changed if there's an urgent or other emerging issue that arises and requires the ISB to do some standard settings. Now, if we look at the next slide, bearing in mind that the board has limited resources, we've asked our stakeholders to comment on where we should be spending our time. And the slide here shows the areas where we could spend that limited time. Now, note that the four areas are not to scale. And we're asking our stakeholders to give us some indication of how much time we should be spending in each of these areas, being new standards or major amendments, maintenance and consistent application of IFRS, digital financial reporting, and of course, the IFRS for SME standard. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on the agenda consultation in this meeting, but I wanted to just give you context as this is significantly impacts on how we could potentially address the accounting for cryptos in the future. Now, if we move on to the next slide, as I mentioned earlier, the RFI and the agenda consultation has asked specifically whether we should address this topic. Now, the RFI gives four potential solutions 
and an indication of the size of the work required to meet each of these. Firstly, the first one, we could develop educational material. Now, these would be effectively non-authoritative and would draw on a lot of the existing standards to propose solutions in this area, uh, much like we've done with the agenda, consulta uh, agenda decision we discussed earlier that the IFRIC issued. Key to note, however, is that we would most likely not look to issue or amend standards to address crypto accounting if this is the route we took. This would purely be educational. Secondly, we could look to amend ICE 38 on intangible assets to better address the accounting for cryptos. Now, for example, if we took this on as a project, we could develop additional disclosure requirements about the fair value of cryptos, or we could even go further and permit more intangible assets to be measured at fair value and consider whether we should be recognizing changes in fair value in the statement of profit or loss in certain circumstances. Now, given that the earlier agenda decision I mentioned already clarifies that cryptos fall within the scope of the standard, many stakeholders feel that we should leave them in the standard. It should also be noted that we are also asking in the IRFI whether we need to do a comprehensive review of ICE 38 in total. So cryptos could end up being covered as part of this project if this is the direction we take. Thirdly, we could also look to amend the scope of IFRS 9 on financial instruments to scope in cryptocurrencies. Now, if they fall into this, these would most likely be accounted for at fair value through profit and loss, which I know many people feel reflects the speculative nature of these types of assets. Lastly, we could also undertake a full project to address a range of non-financial, tangible or intangible assets held solely for investment purposes, which could include, amongst other things, cryptocurrencies. I think note, however, that this would be a large project and would take some time to develop. Moving on. So if we just go to the next slide. So as you can see, there are various options available to the board on how to address this. Um, I guess the last option that wasn't really discussed above was that to do nothing. Uh, some stakeholders believe that with the limited resources available to the ISB, uh, this is an area we shouldn't be giving priority to at this time. They believe that with the number of companies using or investing in cryptos is still relatively small and that there are bigger issues to address in global accounting. With the limited resources, it is something that needs to be considered. However, what needs to be remembered here is that this is a growing area. And given the time taken to research and to issue a new standard, we need to be looking two to three years down the line and asking how big an issue it could be by then. So what's the solution? Well, I guess uh, the message I'm giving is that's what we're asking you. The board's going to look at the responses to the RFI in determining whether to address this area and which of the above approaches we should be, would be the best route for us to undertake. Now, I'd encourage you to ensure that you do submit a response to the RFI if you believe this is an area we need to undertake as a project. Uh, with that being said, I see there are some questions coming through, so I'll hand back to Olivia to ask the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose, uh, for, for that presentation. So I understand that uh, legitimately uh, the ISB is very mindful of its resources. Uh, the good thing is that um, IFRAG is uh, proactively working and is antici can anticipate somehow the work and that the ISB could, uh, could think of and, and, and leverage. Uh, the ISB could leverage on the work that IFRAG is, is doing. Um, so uh, I, I think it's good that IFRAG is, is working on this proactive project because that could help and uh, allow maybe the ISB to, uh, to do a, instead of launch project, maybe a uh, reuse the, the, the load. Um, there are a couple of questions and I, that I, I'm suggesting that we take on before uh, moving on to our panel discussion. Uh, maybe a couple of questions for you, Bruce. Um, uh, one relates to, uh, you, 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 you mentioned in your presentation that uh, the decision made by uh, the ISB is that uh, uh, crypto assets could not be treated as financial assets uh, and not being, not being financial assets because there is no right for cash. But um, one uh, participant is observing that in uh, El Salvador, um, that country now accepts bit Bitcoin as legal currency. Um, and so does it mean that uh, it, it could now be recognized as, as being cash? And it's fair to say that at the time um, the ISB looked at that issue, uh, I, I don't think there was any uh, crypto assets that were considered as being legal currency. So now that we have that situation in El Salvador, 
uh, what would be your view in that respect? Thanks very much, Olivia. I mean, I think that's a very good question. And I think it shows the limitation we have at the moment in this definition of cash. Um, if you go and look at the, the IFRS literature, I don't think we've got a very robust definition of what cash is other than what we, we discussed earlier. And uh, not knowing this, the situation in El Salvador completely, I think we need to be conscious that because somebody accepts something doesn't necessarily mean that it's free legal, you know, it's free tender within that country. I think that this is one of the questions we're going to need to address. Um, if we think that cryptos are going to become almost parallel to a fiat currency and that people will buy and sell and trade and, and literally buy a coffee, as the example was mentioned earlier, using cryptos and that becomes free trade, then we do need to look at the definition of cash. And yes, if we can show that these are being widely used, it's, 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 a, it's a means of tender that's holding its value and people are happy to trade with and it's accepted almost everywhere, then yes, I think we could get to a stage that this does meet the definition of cash. But I think that the, one of the key things that we need to look at would be that core definition of what actually makes up cash. Um, I, I guess maybe the reason it's never been addressed is we've never really needed to address it because we've never faced a situation like this before. Thank you, uh, Bruce. We can see that uh, it, it is fast evolving and that new issues are, are, are arising, which is also making that, that project even more complex. Um, another question maybe for you, Bruce, uh, coming from the audience. Um, which I understand as, as uh, cryptos which are held for trading. Uh, what would be the ISB's view on, on the accounting when cryptos are held for trading? Um, I assume that that's when we, well, if they're held for trading, I mean, I guess the challenge we've got at the moment is what does held for trading mean? So we're not allowing you to put this into trading as we would under an IFRS 9. So we're not saying these fall into that, which means the only place we could really hold it is where we spoke earlier about, uh, or where I spoke earlier, where you could potentially, under the agenda decision, put these into IS2. Now, the challenge with that, of course, is that uh, we, we're not going to, you know, under IS2, we can hold them at fair value. And I think there was some discussion earlier, of course, around what the, how the valuations and, and how that standard uh, and, and how IFRS 13 will kick in with that. And we could be fair value under that. But I think if you're asking purely around whether somebody could just trade them and show them at fair value at the moment, if it was just a normal trading. So, for example, if I went and bought a whole lot of Bitcoin and I, as a company, just want to hold and trade those, at the moment, unfortunately, under ICE 38, uh, you can hold it at fair value, but you're not going to get the trading through PL, which I think most people want. Um, and I think that's probably the limitation with the current accounting options. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Isabel, uh, there is a question that maybe uh, could be for you because you were referring earlier to uh, accounting treatment for ICOs. And uh, a participant is asking about uh, the situation where it would not be an ICO, but uh, STO. Um, what, do you, would you have a, a view on that, on that aspect? Maybe clarifying first, what is STO versus ICO? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Yes, um, the terms are important. So an STO um, is essentially a security token offering. So um, in terms of are they similar to an ICO? What an ICO is an initial coin offering and it can cover various coins, whereas a security token offering is specifically about a security. So I'm thinking, for example, you've probably heard of um, Ripple, RXP, uh, which is currently for the last two years under the debate as to whether it's a security or not um, under SEC rules. So um, that is a security token offering. Whether the accounting should be the same, well, I don't have a, I can say my view, um, it is essentially an offering. So in essence, it has the same characteristics as, for example, um, when any initial exchange offering. It's, a, it's also an issuance of a token. The difference between, um, in my view, of a, a ICO and, for example, and uh, an I. EO is that if you issue it to an exchange, you probably feel safer because the exchange has actually um, done the review of the actual token. So there's a kind of more of a sort of a less risky sort of operation, I would say, than going straight to the to, to the to the issuer 
which uh, sometimes might not be that credible. I mean, the white papers are there, but do we trust the white papers? Well, to know some of them uh, might sort of be written by the guy next door and others might be more credible. But um, so I don't know if I've answered the question, but uh, essentially an STO has a more sort of um, uh, specific meaning in that it's referring to a security token offering. Um, thank you very much, Isabel. Um, so we are going now to move to uh, the second part of our uh, webinar with our panel discussion. Um, uh, so I welcome Renata, uh, Maria, Denise, and, and Flora again. Um, so Renata, um, uh, you are working for, a, for Galaxy Digital, uh, which is a public entity listed in Toronto. Um, and this company provides diversified financial services dedicated to digital, ass digital assets. So could you tell us, uh, well, first, how um, uh, crypto assets play a role in your business model? What are the accounting challenges uh, that, that, you, that you foresee and that you are, that you are facing, actually? Thank you, Olivier. Um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's very interesting to hear this discussion. And I would be remiss not to congratulate really AFRAG for this extensive consultation paper, putting it out. I think it is um, not only it highlights many accounting challenges, but it also is a great educational tool for anyone that is looking to get more insight as to how to better, um, what are the possible account, you know, accounting treatments for these assets in, in lieu of um, various uh, operations or types of entities that are presenting it. Galaxy Digital is a publicly held entity. It trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange and um, reports under IFRS. Galaxy Digital offers <clears throat> a variety of uh, financial services products um, to, um, to institutional investors focusing strictly on digital assets. So if you were to you know, uh, describe the business, we offer uh, principal investments, we offer trading services, we offer asset management, as well as investment banking and mining within the space. So there is a broad application and um, uh, uh, activity is varies greatly in terms of uh, what type of transactions actually occur within the entity. Um, that being said, for financial st statement reporting, we take the uh, broker trader accounting under um, AIS2, which then allows us to account for these assets at fair value. And that's our main sort of, I just wanted to put it out there so um, there is a, a little bit of a background. From my perspective, um, the accounting challenges have been highlighted by, by all of you before here, um, speaking about the valuation of these assets. Since they are classified mostly, they will be classified mostly as non-financial assets. And with that sort of classification for accounting purposes, you know, there is really no accounting standard that allows these types of assets to be considered at fair value, other than taking them into this exemption for, for people that hold it in the ordinary course of business, right? And I think that is sort of where the the um, biggest item is where the biggest consideration, where the focus should be, um, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, spent or time should be spent on allowing these non-financial assets that are entering our economy, be able to classify them or at least consider them for um, at fair value accounting when they when when they are held for investment purposes because most of these assets are held for investment purposes they have cash like application they do experience market volatility there are markets for these assets and so they are behaving like investment assets and yet they're non financial and so i think there is like this divergence um, when uh, I think that, you know, intangible, intangibles um, in general, they, they don't quite fit 
how the uh, digital assets are, how they're used, for what purposes they're used. And I think that is the biggest challenge. And that's where the discussion possibly could be, you know, this is where this, the, it's a good start to, to see how that could be, how that could be solved. From our perspective, I think, you know, digital assets probably should be considered as a separate class of assets. And you have this, um, when you go deeper into this consideration, you'll have digital assets that don't have physical asset representation in the world. And then you'll have assets, phys uh, digital assets that do have physical representation in the world. And so I think from that perspective, that is yet another perspective, um, sort of perspective on how to look at this. Because, for example, digital gold, we already have physical gold in the world. And this digital gold is a just a digital representation of that asset. And so when we look at the accounting treatment from the industry perspective, I think it's important to keep that in mind, that some of these assets do already have a representation um, in, in, the in, in the financial world, in the real world, in the economy, versus some of them don't. Bit there is no Bitcoin. There is no physical asset for Bitcoin, but there is a physical asset in, in, you know, represented for in commodities, in real property, in art, in uh, games that are out there. So I think that's one perspective I wanted to give um, to the accounting, um, you know, profession. The other, the other thing I think that is um, a very, it is um, coming out more than not, it's a challenge of reviewing um, evidence, accounting evidence that can be then used to determine rights and obligations of a holder, issuer, uh, or anybody that invests in, the, in these digital assets. I think we as accountants are very used to reviewing legal documents. And based on legal documents, we determine what is what are the rights and obligations. And when we enter this digital world, there are not always legal documents available. And we then have to consider, like, for example, um, when a new token is issued, you, you probably will see three key pieces of supporting documents. And that will be the smart contract code. It will be a white paper. And in most cases, not always, in most cases, these tokens are accompanied by an audit, technical audit report. Well, you should, you know, and we know that none of these documents constitute a legal uh, contract. Right. And so from that perspective, you know, not only sometimes do they require technical knowledge and expertise to help us accountants interpret the rights and obligations embedded in those supporting documents, but we also have to seriously consider the legal enforceability of it. Because it is it is important to to determine whether um, rights and obligations are actually legally enforceable. So those are the things that are, um, you know, challenges from the industry perspective, as well as um, valuation. So let's talk about valuation. Many of you, you know, uh, have mentioned it as a challenge for the accounting, and I agree. Um, I also would like to uh, give you a perspective from the industry, and that is um, one of the model valuation model that was put forward, or the methodology that was put forward in the FRAG consultation, included uh, a definition of an active market that includes digital assets trading against fiat. And I do have to say, and um, that that market represents only a very small portion of the overall market in digital assets. Only a very small portion of digital assets trade against fiat currencies, but all digital assets, we'll say significantly all, digital assets trade against stablecoin. There is, you know, there is this, um, if, if we are to consider active market that only includes fiat currencies, we're dismissing 80% of the market that is there for digital assets. 
We're also um, sometimes, and this happens when there is volatility. It, it shows when when there is a you know more active. The markets are more active, and there is volatility in the market. The fiat currencies, pricing for fiat currencies is not representative of the overall market prices for coins. And then the third point I, I wanted to make is that um, certain coins, and this will apply to something like Polkadot or TRX, Tron, um, you know, these coins have a uh, market capitalization of in billions. And yet, you know, if you were to consider the accounting standards today, trading in fiat, they, these pairs don't trade in fiat. And so you could, you could, you, you would say that for these coins, there is no active market, which I'm not sure that that, you know, again, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that should be fixed and considered. And, you know, um, to, to properly account for, for these assets as the market is really developing very quickly. Uh, the markets, the, because, because people are investing in these assets, the markets are growing, they're stabilizing. And as more people invest in these assets, the, the, the markets themselves are not as volatile as they were when first speculators came into the market and traded them. So that's what we experience from the market. The last point I wanted to make is, and this is for you know, um, you know anybody, any accounting professional out there. The, the crypto markets trade 24/7. There is no close of day. And I think that we all have to think about whether that's a significant accounting policy that should be included in the financial reporting, because if I report financial statements as of 00 UTC time that may, on December 31st. That may be very different than 5 p.m. or 4 p.m. European time. My valuation will be very different than your valuation. And that, I think, is something that needs to be highlighted, how these markets really don't have a concept of an end of day uh, close prices, you know, market stopping and resting for the day, settlement. Settlement does not exist like this. So that's those are the things that I wanted to, um, you know, give you insight from the industry uh, as a holder issuer from the financial, you know, uh, as a preparer of financial statements of how that looks like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renata. Um, so now I'm going to um, hand it over to Marion. Um, Marion is a head of accounting and financial policies in the BBVA group, so banking industry, and uh, as such, that uh, that group is engaged uh, in um, um, holding of well, in, in custodial uh, services. Uh, Vincent, uh, you mentioned earlier that it was an area where there was a, a need for guidance. So, Maria, could you let us know what are the challenges that, that you face as, uh, as uh, uh, with respect to your custodial services? Yeah, of course, Olivier. Uh, thank you, Efrak, for inviting me to be here today with all of you. So, uh, I'm going to give you my insights uh, after the accounting analysis we perform about this line of business that BBVA has recently opened. Uh, BBVA has started uh, Bitcoin custodial and trading services to clients of private banking in Switzerland. Uh, BBVA is a global financial services group with an important position in the Spanish market in Mexico, South America, and Turkey, among others. However, from the countries of our footprint, we are now limiting this new cryptocurrency service to Switzerland because we noticed that this country has clear regulation and a widespread adoption of digital assets. From an accounting point of view, our analysis was focused to conclude if the bank controls or does not control the bitcoins under custody. If the bank controls the bitcoins, it should recognize an asset in the balance sheet. And then we understand that we should apply the current IFRED guidelines. Otherwise, if the bank did not control the bitcoins, the bank would just be recording a service for their clients, and then IFRS 15 would apply to account for the fees received. The main challenge that we, the accountants, found was to get a good understanding of the characteristics, the risks, 
the rights and obligations of the custodial and trading services we are providing. The analysis we perform involved understanding the traditional financial risks of these services, such as liquidity, market, credit, or counterparty risks, and also taking into account specific non-financial risks of credit crypto assets, such as uh, cyber or operational risk, legal or third-party risk. In this case, for example, the risk of a broker breaching the, its obligations. So, in order to have that understanding, we maintain several interviews with the internal experts of the bank of the different disciplines involved to deepen into the details of the blockchain technology and the legal and regulatory aspects of the crypto assets. The main facts that led us to conclude that the bank does not control the bitcoins that we custody on behalf of our clients uh, were, first, uh, the, clay, the clients deposit their digital assets in individual and segregated wallets and not in omnibus, omnibus wallets. And this fact uh, we consider was very important because legally it implies that the bank does not have any obligation over the bitcoins and their custody. Second, the bank acts as an intermediary between the broker and the client for the purchase and sale of crypto assets, always following the client's instructions. Although the clients don't have access to the private keys and they must operate through the bank because it's the one, the bank, who has access uh, to them, the bank's actions are limited to the client's guidelines in accordance with the, contract, with the contract between the bank and the client. And neither the bank has any right over the bitcoins and the custody, nor it can operate with them unless expressly authorized by the client. Third, the agreement establishes that the client bears all the risks associated with the transactions, including counterparty risk or the risk that the broker breaches its obligations, as I mentioned before. Likewise, the client knows and bears other risks specific of crypto assets, except in case of fraud or negligence by the bank, such as the risk of loss of the private keys or a cyber attack. And lastly, the only cash flows that the bank obtains are the fees charged to the clients for the services of custody and trading. And it does not have the, the ability to obtain additional cash flows for the control of the assets. It is true that the fee that is charged for the trading service partly depends on the value of the crypto assets in a fiat currency. However, the bank does not have the ability to act over the value of the assets and it cannot influence the activity of the clients because the bank, in our case, will never provide investment advice. So to conclude and in summary, I can tell you that from my accounting point of view, the main challenge we got was to get a good knowledge of the risk and rewards of the custodial and trading services we are providing. Once we had those clear, we did, the truth is that we did, we did not have much problems when applying the revenue recognition criteria under IFRS 15. Thank you, um, uh, Maria. Uh, so uh, I suggest now that we uh, we had the perspective of two um, preparers in, in, from a different angle. Uh, now, what we would be interested in is to have the, the, the view from a uh, user perspective, and then I hand it over to, to Denis. Um, Denis, if you could uh, let us know when looking at financial statements of um, uh, reporting entities that hold or issue cryptos, what are the areas that are currently of most concern? And uh, are the concerns such that uh, we need to rely on non-gap measurements? Okay, thank you, Olivier. Um, just for background, so I'm within the user community, um, um, what's called an equity person. So I spent 20 years in equities before moving to academia. Um, I still, together with a former ISB board member, write on valuation and accounting topics as the footnotes analyst. So early this year, we wrote about uh, the financial reporting challenges of Bitcoin for um, users, investors. And we put the spotlight on uh, the purchase of uh, crypto assets by uh, non-financial firms. So the question is, what's the information that we need uh, to assess performance, derive valuation for non-financial firms, 
uh, if we are uh, reviewing the issue of crypto assets slash liabilities. Now, without want to dive into too much detail on the valuation, what we generally do, we derive an enterprise value number for the business as a whole. Uh, we deduct the firm's uh, liabilities and we add uh, the investments whose earnings contribution is not captured in the value of the business as a whole. Now, non-financial firms, uh, holdings of crypto assets would be labeled as investment uh, assets, as uh, Renata explained. So that both in terms of the liability side and the asset side, to get from what we call the enterprise value to the equity value, uh, you need the fair value. So you need the fair value of your liabilities, you need the fair value of your assets. Now, these investment assets are not always under IFRS uh, under fair value. So arguably, uh, to some extent, the fact that uh, crypto assets are covered by IS38 is in that sense not necessarily an obstacle to deriving a fair value. But it does feel like crypto assets are more financial instruments in nature. So why not use the uh, fair value measurement? Um, now, as Bruce, as Bruce elaborated, I think many stakeholders would go with that uh, preference uh, on the accounting side. Now, in terms of non-GAAP, uh, whether the user community is going to resort to non-GAAP uh, when we're looking at gains or losses, impairments uh, on uh, crypto assets, uh, I'm not necessarily convinced. I think if there is sufficient disaggregation uh, of income and expense items, we, knew, we need not necessarily resort to um, a non-GAAP measure. Uh, once again, it's the disclosure the detail that matters that will allow us to draw our own conclusions whether items of income and expense are included in uh, performance metrics and whether they're relevant for forecasting and valuation. I um, want to keep it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Uh, I'd like to, to come back to Maria, um, who explained to us uh, the challenges that she had as uh, custodial services. Uh, but it would be also interesting to, to have um, an understanding of uh, the level of, of crypto which is observed in the banking industry. Yes, thank you, Olivia. Uh, the Basel Committee published last month a consultative document with a preliminary proposal, proposal of the prudential treatment for crypto, for crypto assets. In that paper, the committee observes that the past few years have seen rapid growth and innovation in crypto assets, as I, it was mentioned before in this webinar and that there is a heightened interest of some banks. However, in general, banks' exposures to crypto assets remain currently limited. I reckon that the main reason for that limited the direct exposure in banks is that the legal and regulatory framework is not developed yet in most countries. There are many gray areas around operating with cryptocurrencies, and in general, financial institutions are not comfortable operating under a legal void. Additional, additionally, I think that the high degree of volatility of some kind of crypto assets like Bitcoin and other non-stable coins also explains the low level of direct exposures by banks. Other factors that could also explain this limited exposure in banks' portfolios are the lack of transparency of who owns or sponsors the crypto assets in some cases, as well as some problems with the ready convertibility into fiat money. And finally, it should be noted that in Europe, at least, although the banking regulators and supervisors have not formally prohibited, prohibited financial institutions from investing in cryptocurrencies, it is also true that their position is conservative about it. Nevertheless, I think that banks could show a growing interest in cryptocurrencies in the following years. In Europe, for example, the proposal for a new regulation on markets in crypto assets is an important step to provide legal security, although it, it would take some years for such a proposal to work its way through the European policy-making apparatus. Uh, however, while the text is not more defined and the financial entities know clearly their regulatory and legal framework, I don't think we will see a significant growth in banks' direct exposures in crypto assets. And I, finally, I would also like to take this opportunity to say 
that it will be interesting to see how the different types of crypto assets will evolve, and in particular, the design and creation of central bank digital currencies. Although we don't see its use as a form of, in of investment, uh, we think that uh, digital, central bank digital currencies could facilitate, could facilitate international transactions, could cut costs for customers, and could operate in a transparent manner. So, therefore, it will be important to follow how these principles translate into practice. Thank you very much, um, Maria. Um, so, now let's look at um, our topic through the angle of um, uh, auditors and assurance to be provided with respect to um, uh, cryptos. Uh, we understand that there are uh, challenges, and that would be uh, interesting to hear Flora, um, as uh, Flora is uh, a partner with PwC and, and dealing with auditing issues on, on those aspects. Flora. Uh, thank you, Olivier. So I think that no one would be surprised if I say that crypto assets are a very, very complex audit area for us. Um, so one of our main challenge we have is the lack of general education um, in, in, uh, inside the CFO's population. And they are telling us that they are still lacking of general understanding of the crypto transaction. And the issue is that if you don't understand the crypto assets business, you may not understand in detail the substance of the crypto transaction that your company is doing, and then you may wrongly account for and disclose them in your financial statements. So really the challenge for the CFOs is to have a very good understanding of, of the crypto transaction and then reflect them correctly uh, in, in the financial statements. The second issue we have is regarding ownership and completeness of crypto assets. Uh, we all know that blockchain is decentralized. And so for auditors like PwC, our main issue is that there is no regulated institutions such as banks that are going to be able to confirm that our client is the owner and the sole owner of the crypto assets recording in the balance sheet. And there are no regulated institutions such as banks that are able to confirm the number and value of crypto assets trading during the year or recording at the balance sheet date. So we need to find other way to gain comfort on, on these two uh, aspects, ownership and completeness of crypto assets. So some audit firms like PwC, we have developed our own independent and reliable blockchain explorer and audit tool in order to be able to perform these independent corroborative procedures on ownership and completeness of crypto assets regarding the financial statements. The third challenge is regarding internal control and governance. Some of our clients, they have lost their private keys of their wallet. They have pushed uh, some smart contracts into the blockchain with the wrong codes and for sure, after they have very difficulties to, 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 to correct the situation. And, and this was because they have not enough, uh, not enough robust internal control. So really for auditors, it's one of the biggest part of our audit strategy is to be sure that the governance and internal control around crypto activities of the company are enough robust. Another point, and I think that we have already covered this subject, is, uh, of course, valuation. And we put a lot of attention about the valuation method that it is used, the assumptions, the data also that are used to value some crypto positions, and also the notes to the financial statement, for, of course. Challenge number five is underlying rights and obligation. And I fully agree with Renata mentioned earlier that the level of documentation of underlying rights and obligation associated with crypto assets is very diverse 
from crypto assets to another, and this leads to complex accounting challenges most of the time. And last point is disclosures to the financial statement. And as we said uh, during this webinar, there are many, many judgmental and complex areas. And our view as auditors is that the disclosures and notes to the financial statements are very key for re readers and should be very com complete and uh, developed as much as possible. Thank you, Flora. Uh, so that leads us to um, uh, our last uh, question um, to our uh, panel. Uh, Vincent had uh, offered various options. Um, Vincent and Isabel, actually, uh, offered different options with, uh, on, on how to deal from a standard setting point of view and how to deal with uh, the, the issues and challenges that have been um, expressed earlier. Um, and, and so uh, what would be interesting is to, to understand from our, um, uh, from our panel, what are your views on each of those uh, options which are being offered? Um, Denise, can I ask for your, for your view? Thank you, Olivier. Uh, well, I think, as, as mentioned earlier, um, fair value seems to be the appropriate uh, measurement base, uh, which would uh, more logically put you in the category of uh, financial um, instruments. I was intrigued by Bruce's uh, observation that perhaps the measurement bases under IS38 uh, should be uh, changed uh, to include some intangible assets at fair value. Now, luckily, AFRAC has a project on the go on that one as well. Uh, but apart from that, the question is, are you not opening the door to um, the more subjective areas of intangible assets? So fair value, uh, fair value through profit and loss, I think, from an investor perspective, would be the preferred option. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, so same question to you, Maria. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, first, I think that option one, that is uh, doing nothing, so don't change any IFRS requirements, uh, should not be an option. Because in my view, uh, IFRS is not working well for holdings of crypto assets, for example. Uh, regarding option three, that is develop a complete new standard on crypto assets, I have doubts about whether it is possible, if it is possible to include now all the casuistry around crypto assets, both from the holder and an issuer's perspective, due to the rapid evolution and innovation of these assets at this moment. So they, therefore, I think that option two, that is amends on existing IFR requirements, is the most sensible option at this moment. And in particular, uh, as, a, as, a, as I see it, is that the current intangible asset accounting and the IS38 for investment in crypto assets does not fit well with their nature and economics. On the one hand, applying the amortized cost model does not provide, in my opinion, relevant information. The historical cost seems completely irrelevant uh, due to the high volatility in the price of these assets. And to be honest, uh, I foresee significant challenges to determine when to make an impairment and recognize a loss uh, in the income statement. And on the other hand, uh, I fail to see the logic uh, for applying the revaluation model under IS38 for crypto assets with an active market, where revaluations are recognized in OCI, but devaluations in PNL. Uh, so, in my view, uh, holdings of crypto assets should be recognized at fair value through profit and loss. And to complement this, I also think that uh, appropriate and relevant disclosures should be provided, uh, explaining the nature of the assets, the business model for the investment, and details about the valuation techniques used, and of course, the, vol the volatility in, in, this, in the price of these assets. And I have also been considering the possibility of using an option of fair value through OCI, such as the one that currently exists in IFRS 9 for equity investments. Nevertheless, this accounting technique is quite controversial, and it could be one of the topics for the post-implementation review of IFRS 9 that the IISB will carry out in the following months. So at this moment, I would not suggest it now for crypto assets. And in addition, 
the other topic I think that uh, could IFRS uh, would need probably to be amended is the definition of cash, as it was been mentioned before in this in this webinar. I am thinking here uh, above all about the adapting the definition to include the issuance of central bank digital digital currencies. That is probably what we will see in the following years, and maybe some stable coins issued by private companies. Thank you, uh, Maria. And so, um, uh, last but not least, uh, Renata, um, what is your view on, on those three options? Thank you. And I will agree um, wholeheartedly here with Maria and also Dennis on their analysis and their view. Um, we would suggest that the revisions of the current standards would be most appropriately applied or would guide best the application of various aspects for digital assets. I will say that um, uh, we would also um, propose or suggest that actually a new standard should be developed for mining activities. Those activities are not currently anyhow represented in the accounting standards, and there are very um, there are various unique aspects of that activity um, for which there is really no representation in the current accounting standards, and that's something that um, I believe we should focus on as a new standard for mining um, uh, of digital assets. Thank you, Renata. Um, so uh, there has been a polling question that we can look at. Uh, difficult to draw any conclusion from that, but it seems that there is um, that there is a equal need for guidance uh, for uh, holders of crypto assets, issuers as well as um, valuation. Um, uh, uh, so. Uh, it's difficult to say that one is more important than another, even though we have some numbers, uh, but it seems that everything is, is equally important. Um, so um, uh, there is a last uh, polling question that uh, has been sent to you, um, and I guess you can take the time to, uh, to respond, um, which uh, now takes us to uh, our Q&A session, uh, if uh, there are any questions which are which remain uh, unanswered, um, I think I've seen one. Uh, yes, uh, a question that maybe is for uh, Maria. Uh, so Maria, in your custodial um, uh, activity, you mentioned that there were different factors that you were looking at to assess whether you were acting as, as agent or, or, or principal. Um, so among the, the three factors, do you, do, you see, do you see that, do you think that there are, uh, one is being sufficiently determinative in, in concluding that, uh, that BBVA has, has no control over uh, the crypto assets that uh, it holds? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned, I think that uh, all of them uh, were important to, uh, to achieve the conclusion. Um, the, first, uh, the first topic I mentioned was the, the, legal, the legal topic. And in this regard, it was, for us, it was very important to have this comfort about Switzerland, about that uh, Switzerland has a, a legal framework, uh, a very strong legal framework, and there, uh, and according to the Opera the contract we had with our clients, uh, we could conclude that the bank did have, does not have any obligation over the bitcoins under custody. So this legal topic was really important. But also, we had also to, to take into account, of course, the, the different parts of the contract between the client and the bank, about, and the fact that the bank is just an intermediary, that we are always following the, the client's instructions, and that we are never providing uh, investment advice uh, was also uh, very important to conclude. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Um, another question maybe for uh, Kiara. Um, we, we talked about uh, standard setting for the, the eyes visible in IFRS, but a question arises as to whether there is a similar project in the U.S. by uh, FASB? 
Well, uh, we we know that uh, they are monitoring this uh, this issue, and uh, uh, it may be soon on their agenda. We understand that this is part also of their agenda consultation that has been recently uh, initiated also from them. So it's another important topic where the two boards need to look at one to the other reciprocally and see if we can get uh, consistent answers. Uh, thank you, Chiara. Um, so that uh, leads us, I can't see any more uh, questions. Um, so that leads us to, to the end of our session. Um, I'd like to, to thank all our panelists um, uh, for their contributions to, to, this, uh, to, to this webinar. Uh, I think that um, it's, um, it, it was interesting to, to hear well, how fast and those uh, issues with respect to crypto assets are emerging and, and growing. We understand from, uh, especially from the, well, first from uh, um, the, the numbers that uh, Flora has disclosed that uh, it has been evolving um, very fast during the past year. And uh, uh, the anticipation that uh, you as participants have expressed is that it's going to, to continue to grow further. Um, therefore, that there is uh, obviously, uh, a need to to face many challenges, being uh, operational from a preparedness perspective, uh, regulatory as well, um, but also from a reporting standpoint, uh, to, to 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 tackle all those uh, those challenges. And so, uh, from a uh, from a standard setting point of view, there are also our uh, part to a role to play in that respect. Um, so we we heard. Um, uh, Boris's view on, on well, is it something that the ISB will, will take on as, as a project? Uh, what we hear is that um, there is obviously uh, some expectations that uh, it will be the case. So we um, we uh, uh, invite all the, the stakeholders to to respond to the consultations which has been um, which is uh, uh, which has been published by by EFRAG. Uh, you have until the end of, of this month. So um, not too late to, to respond, and your comments will be very valuable to, uh, to progress further, and, and hopefully that will uh, help also the, the ISB to, to give some further thoughts as to what the scale of the project can be and, and how to respond to the needs the most appropriately. Um, with that said, um, I think there is a last graph which I am happy to, to show and to share. Um, uh, from from um, from the participants, um, which uh, of the three options uh, would be the most appropriate? Uh, so, um, with with, uh, uh, I think that everyone agrees, with very little exception, that uh, there is obviously the need for for some guidance. Um, now, views are split between uh, amending and creating a new standard from scratch. Uh, I think it is something that uh, the ISB will, will have to decide upon, uh, and because the, the, the scale of the project are obviously not, not the same. So I uh, thank you very much for participating and contributing to, to that webinar. Uh, and um, this, um, uh, this webinar has been recorded, uh, and so you will be able to, to see it on uh, FRAG's website, but also on, on YouTube. Thank you very much. Wish you a very good afternoon. Bye, everyone.